but just raise your hand or holler it out or, or whatever you want to do. I don't think you'll have any trouble hearing us. I'm about booming myself out here. So, uh, but if anything, uh, if anything uh, it pops up in your mind as a question or you didn't quite understand, feel free to feel free to ask. I'm Todd Kessner. I am the uh, associate specialist uh, at the Montana 4-H uh, Center in Bozeman, and uh, I'm in charge of horses, livestock, shooting sports, and wildlife uh, for the state 4-H program. And this is Will Abbott, and Will is a volunteer for 4-H, and he is also the photographer who uh, helped us out on this project, and you'll see his pictures all evening long. You're looking uh, at one now. There we are. <laughs> yeah, kind of our... Uh, it kind of became our trademark picture for this, for this project. Will is also a, a historical interpreter at Nevada City, and so if you visit Virginia City and Nevada City uh, any weekend in the summer, more than likely you'll find Will dressed very much like he is, like he is right now. So I want to tell you a little bit about what this uh, project is all about and how it got started and uh, how it ties into the State 4-H program. And then we'll take a look at uh, some of the artifacts that we found around the state that uh, helped us uh, put together this reference book that we've, that we've done. Uh, we've, we've visited about 16 different museums and found different artifacts from the Old West period. And the period that, uh, that we study and, and present on is from 1860 to, to 1900. Uh, and just found some really, really interesting things. Small town museums, uh, big museums, just uh, well received every, everywhere that we went. And Will took the pictures and I wrote the words. And, uh, we do have books for sale if anyone's interested after the presentation. Uh, neither Will and I or I make any money off it. It all goes back into the 4-H program. But how this all started is I had 4-H uh, youth in, in shooting sports for years and years. And uh, when those kids got to be about 14, 15 years old, uh, they started dropping out of the program. And I was at a 4-H camp, and there was a bunch of guys there, uh, teen, teen counselors, and I said, you know, you guys have been part of, you know, part of 4-H for a long time and part of shooting sports for a long, long time. And now that it gets time where you're teenage years and you can compete nationally or travel and, and, and really get going in, in shooting sports, you know, you've quit. And why is that? And they said, you know, when you shoot a, a pellet through a piece of paper for six or seven years and you're not interested in uh, heavy-duty competition, you just want to be a safe gun handler and you wanted to be a good marksman and you've met those goals, then there really isn't much left for you uh, in the 4-H program. And so we'd see those kids just kind of get bored and quit. So I started talking about uh, cowboy action shooting with them. And I explained what that was. And in the, in the introduction here, we'll, we'll show you what that is. Uh, but it's an action-based uh, shooting uh, discipline that uh, just allows you to move around, allows you to shoot faster, you shoot different guns. It's, it's kind of a timed game. Uh, and it was real appealing to these, to these teens. And so uh, we've seen a lot of teenagers come back into the 4-H shooting sports program uh, because of this. And a so, whole lot more of their families. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is a, uh, and as you'll see tonight, this is a project that, uh, that really we, we attract kids through their dad, it seems like, more than, uh, more than anything, because uh, dads get real interested, because we all grew up with the Virginian and John Wayne movies and, and all of that, and, and, you know, we've missed it. It hasn't been, the Western hasn't been around much, and these kids um, just don't have any idea what a, what a wagon train is or, or uh, the Oregon Trail or the Bozeman Trail or, or any of the things that really, history of the West. So I'm going to start telling you a little bit about the, the shooting portion of the uh, project so you understand how we got started. So cowboy action shooting, and we're actually calling it Western action shooting now to go along with the theme of the Western Heritage Project. I should change this slide. Uh, but you dress in, in Old West clothing, or at least as close as you can. We don't require kids to go out and get as uh, authentic as we try to do in these lectures. Uh, but you dress like a sheriff or a cowboy or a Native American or a cavalry trooper or whatever. Uh, maybe your interest. We use, we use Old West sidearms, rifles, and shotguns. And our targets are these large steel plates, and you just have to hit the target. And it makes a ding. And uh, you go through a series of targets, and the fastest time wins. Anything that you've missed, if you don't hear the ding, that's an indication that there was a miss. And uh, there's a five-second penalty added to your time uh, if you miss a target. I'll show you a little video, give you an idea of what, what this looks like. Maybe. Now, while that's tuning in, 
You might need to use a mouse. Might have to use my regular mouse for this one. Um, while that's tuning in, the primary focus of 4-H shooting sports isn't what's being shot or being shot at. The primary focus is that youth become more responsible, they become safer, and they become cognizant of their own needs to make decisions and take responsibility for those consequences. As a result, in 30 plus years of 4-H shooting sports, we've had no uh, direct injuries that we're aware of, except maybe one in, in archery, because this 4-H uh, shooting sports covers archery, muzzle loading skills, shotgunning, air rifle, air pistol, and other rifle sports, and now the Western action. So the result is the outcome we desire is kids who are making good decisions and making good choices about their lives. And that's really the primary focus of what we do. These tools, the firearms of the American West, were actually used. And they were used for defense, for hunting, and for offensive use at various times. Of course, we'd want our kids to understand the difference before they ever even get on the range which was part of the motivation and the creation of the book, was that there's a whole lot more to the cowboy era than just shooting guns, riding horses, and chasing stampedes, and, and the red man versus the white man, and all of that myth and historic fact. Uh, so as kids go through this part, they, they become interested, they realize that their local museums exist, they realize that there's an opportunity to, to see something that interests them. You know you're onto something when a youngster 14 years of age comes up to you with a book that's about two inches thick and heavy enough he's holding it with two hands and saying, look what I bought. Not look what my parents got me, look what I borrowed or found with his own money, look what I bought and it's a two inch history book. That's when you know something's going right. And that's the genesis of the program. Something think? has locked me up, absolutely. Cannot move to the next slide, can't back up, can't get the video to go. Um, can you remove the remote and that's reboot and set up? I'm going to have to. I'll take, while you're doing that, I'll take a It's going to have to be a hard shutdown, too, unfortunately. Yeah, unfortunately. The clothing that I'm wearing, uh, you may recognize the blue sack coat or uh, uh, forage coat of the Union Trooper. Many people who arrived on the West arrived here legitimately with the military and were released. Many more arrived here, whether Confederate or U.S., in the 1860s having taken French leave, otherwise known as let themselves out, and never went back. And oftentimes they came with them, with the gear, with the accoutrements that they had when they left the military. So in Nevada City, I portray someone who has left the military or in service with the military as a guide. And I'm using a mixture of military and civilian clothes, such as actually happened in that time period. I am an historian of the firearms of the era, but I also use the same skills when I'm teaching kids that I use in interpreting to the public. How are you coming along? It's going to take a minute. St still still yeah. taking a minute. This is sort of an ad lib kind of a moment uh, because what we do every time we address our kids is we want them to take away something new that they just didn't catch before. We don't care what that is, whether it's a skill as simple as how to safely load or safely empty a firearm, or an aiming skill, improving their actual accuracy, because that's where we want them to start. It doesn't matter what shooting sport kids start in. They start at the basics, safety and accuracy. Safety first, load, unload, safe handling. Then how do you safely use a firearm? What are the principles? And then after that, try to speed up, try to develop the skill, try to have more fun. Because if they're not having fun, they're not learning. And if it's not action-oriented in some way, then they're still stalled in what they're doing. Each of the firearms that we talk to you about tonight, we'll talk about them in a chronological order because the history of these firearms is so amazing in itself, how different companies overlap with different designs. One of my favorite firearms to talk about in Nevada City it's the height of technology in 1865, and as Captain James Liberty Fisk, I will tell you that this is the most effective firearm for defense on the frontier, because you can load up to 16 shots in succession, merely by removing the follower, rotating the barrel, 
shroud and load 16 rimfire cartridges. When you replace the follower and work the action, you load a fresh round in the elevator. For each repeating shot, empty the previous one, you're ready to aim and fire. This is the end of a progression. It's the height of technology for me in 1865. It took just 15 years to go from a muzzle-loading rifled arm to this capability. A man can carry several hundred rounds on his person and have the ability to defend himself or his party for an extended period of time without damage to their cartridges, without damage to their firearm, even if, if they sustain wet or damp for a period of time. Unlike Sharps' cartridges, which are made of paper or linen, if they receive direct contact with water, they're no longer usable. The percussion cap is a wonderful thing, but once it's been built into the cartridge, now it is dry and protected. As each of these has been used and changed, the rate of fire has increased, but accuracy is still paramount. Now that is how I talk to people and I talk to kids when I'm at Nevada City. I talk in that first person presentation, which we use, which is part of the reason for the clothing. It's not just a costume for us, it's a way of educating, which is really what the program is supposed to be about. And I picked the Henry because that's the extent of my time period there. Here, we continue to talk about the genesis of these firearms. Henry's patent in 1866 becomes the Winchester 1866. It's the first of the Winchester rifles, commonly called the Yellow Boy. So this is the first one actually known as a Winchester. Oliver Winchester was a shirt manufacturer. And this is the type of thing we have more time we talk about in the book. We want kids to understand that the people who were creating these things weren't necessarily the people who lived on the frontier or who had the, the wherewithal. They were the, the factories. They were the businessmen. They weren't all everybody living out there. They brought the tools with them. In 1873, they cleaned up, got rid of the brass, which was weak, so they could use more powerful cartridges, cleaned up the lines because they were using steel. The first Henry rifles weren't brass. They were actually made of iron. But in 1873, the pistol cartridge, same exact elevator system, except it's made out of steel instead of brass. And one of the differences is this small but important dust cover for carrying. And this is when the firearm becomes a scabbard capable. So all of a sudden, as you look through the history, as you look through a book, scabbards under the uh, saddle become possible and practical because of the nature of the firearms being created. So firearms beget tooling and clothing, and the ability to make things differently in the tooling and clothing change the firearms and their presence on the frontier. Hey, we're going. You're going. Sound. We're going without sound. But then one thing is another. We do, you notice how Todd had to put the remote gear with As he moves from one station to the next, he has no firearm in his hands, loaded or unloaded. So he shot that course in 36 seconds and one one hundredth of a second, 36.01. <clears throat> he had no misses, so he didn't add anything to his time. And uh, the gentleman, 
uh, that you can still see standing outside the outhouse. In one hand, he had a timer which reacts to the uh, report of the firearms. And so the last, the last shot, you look at the clock, and that tells you uh, what the time was for the shooter. And then you'd add on five seconds for every miss. 3601 was his time. It's a pretty good time. He wouldn't. He, this young man won the state championship uh, the first year we had a state championship. I uh, wouldn't be able to probably win it with that uh, with that time anymore. Kids are just getting better, better, and better uh, at this as as we've as we've gone along. So thank you, Will. That was very good. You, anytime I have a technical, you're just thinking the next thing to say. Well, you know, Marshall, <laughs> there's a reason you got yourself a sidekick. <laughs> That's right. You know, they call me Rustus. I got a cousin, he works with another marshal, his name's Festus, Festus Hagen. Well, I'm Rustus. I'm not real fast, but I'm persistent. So this is a basic, uh, there's a lot going on in this chart, but uh, we put rifle targets a little further out, usually five of them or so. Uh, handgun targets are a little bit closer, and we've got knockdown shotgun targets uh, on either side, or sometimes on, on both sides. But we also... I uh, have a safety line in the back. I think I can still use this thing for a laser anyway. Yeah, there we go, good. This is the uh, line where the audience doesn't get any closer. That stay behind that line. We've got a safety zone in here where you have your shooter and your range officer. And uh, we have a supervised loading table right here where uh, the shooter would proceed up to the loading table. Uh, they're taught how to load their firearms. What you saw in that last uh, video clip was a kid that had been at it for a while. They don't do that right off the bat. Uh, they've got to learn how to load the guns properly, and then all of the firearms are staged. We used the outhouse in the video clip. There's a sheriff's office. There's all kinds of these uh, fun little buildings that we use. So the guns are all laid up there, uh, loaded and ready to go. Uh, when the buzzer goes off, and that's when the, when the shooting starts, and usually you have two pistols, a rifle, and a shotgun. And you shoot them till they're empty, set them back down, and then when the shooting is over, uh, the range officer and the 4-H member will come over to the unloading table where they make sure that the guns are unloaded and they're made safe. And when we're sharing guns, which you do quite often, uh, we'll bring those back around and then the next shooter can use them. This is the 170 line, we call it. I didn't put a uh, protractor on there to see if exactly if I'd drawn it, drawn it at 170, but that's the 170 line. The muzzles cannot cross that line. Uh, or it's a safety violation and, and we can move a kid out, uh, of, that, out of that stage. Uh, and that's kind of a cone, so you can't point behind the 170 line above your head either. I must have gone backwards. There we go. So we do require iron ear protection for everyone at the range because uh, uh, obviously it's just as noisy a little bit behind the line as it is at the line and eye protection in case uh, we're shooting lead bullets into steel targets and they disintegrate uh, and hit the ground, but on rare occasion they can hit a rock or something on the ground and the rock comes back. So we just don't want anybody getting hit in the eye with, with anything that might be flying around. And again, uh, loading is done under supervision. So the range officer is right with the shooter. Uh, you can see Tony's hand uh, on one side of Nicole there. His other hand would be holding the timer on the other side. That way if a kid has a question, a gun malfunctions, whatever may happen, then they try to turn around uh, and ask a question and they forget about muzzle direction, uh, then there's somebody right there to stop them. Guns are always pointed down range. Uh, we only allow a two-handed grip on the uh, pistols. Uh, there, when you um, hang on to grip and try to cock a single-action revolver, you've got to pull a hammer back every time. And if you do it with one hand, you've got to kind of release your grip a little bit, reach up with your thumb and pull that hammer back. And the fear is an inexperienced young person can slip and then the gun can, can spin on them and actually point at them. So they hang on to it, really uh, keep a secure grip with one hand and then with their offhand thumb, uh, pull the hammer back. And also, you can't see it here, but right in, right in front of Nicole is the windowsill, just below the photograph, and that's another safety thing, too. It's hard for a kid to ever point a firearm at themselves when they have an obstacle uh, in front of them. So they shoot until the gun's empty, and then they move on uh, empty-handed. Again, there's another shot of uh, following these kids around. It's the most famous hand in the West. It is. It's been shown to a lot of people. Uh, this is the first group of kids that I had. This, we started this uh, about five years ago. And uh, most of these kids are graduated and, and gone, but they were a good, a good guinea pig group. So that's all well and good. We had this project started. We're bringing teenagers back into 4-H. Um, and I thought, you know, this is a, this is a golden opportunity uh, to teach some history where um, 
in, in areas that kids just don't have that opportunity to learn uh, history anymore. And so they're, you know, they're, they're, they're dressing in the Old West clothes, didn't really know why. They're shooting the Old West firearms, didn't really know where they came from necessarily. Uh, and so I decided to go down to the Pioneer Museum, uh, downtown Bozeman, and I was just going to do a little pamphlet on the uh, guns of the Old West. And when I got down there, they had about everything that I, that I needed and took a few pictures. And, and uh, the gal down there said, you know, you ought to go to the Museum of the Rockies because whatever we're missing, they've got. So I went to the Museum of the Rockies, and they said, boy, you know, you ought to go to the historical site in, in Helena. And they said, well, you ought to go to C.M. Russell. Well, anyway, by the time we were done with my little pamphlet on the guns of the Old West, we had a 160-page book that included clothing, hats, boots, and chaps, leather goods, uh, you know, the, the scabbards Will was talking about, holsters, and all that sort of thing. And so this has really become a, a two-pronged project. One is gun safety and fun, uh, and it's a good family activity. A lot of moms and dads have participated as well. But the other one is learning how to, uh, learning a lot about the frontier west, particularly the Montana frontier west, and really a fun living history way to do it. They're not just uh, watching slideshows all the time like this one. They're actually dressing the part. They're, they're using the firearms. They're asking questions. And uh, Will had kind of uh, indicated that as well. When kids come up to us and start telling us about the books they've bought, uh, it's pretty neat to know that they're actually, they're actually really starting to grasp this and show an interest. At the very beginning, I had some resistance, and the, uh, they're like, oh, man, history is boring. We don't want to learn history. It's just boring. Uh, but if we've got to listen to you every now and then, we will because we get to shoot. And uh, by the end of that first year, I had kids ask me, okay, if I'm building my own shirt, where does the seam go? Where does the button go on my cuff? I mean, just really nitpicky little things, but they wanted to do things absolutely perfect. So I'm just going to show you uh, just, a, just a smattering of what's in the book and some of the artifacts that we came across in Montana uh, that we've used to educate the kids with. So we'll talk briefly about Sam Colt. And uh, interesting, very interesting, ingenious fellow, and not only uh, a very good business person, but also a very prolific inventor. And uh, even when he was a very young man, uh, seven years old, was taking things apart. His father owned a mill, and he was very mechanical. He could take things apart, uh, much like I could when I was a kid, but he couldn't get them back together necessarily, and, and so it kind of frustrated his dad. Um, but eventually, uh, well, his dad got so frustrated, he sent him to a boarding school, and he was experimenting with gunpowder, and he burned that down. And then they put him on a ship to send him off and learn the, uh, some skills in the as a sailor, and, and uh, he got to see a lot of the world doing that. But when he came back, uh, he had thought up the idea of a revolving pistol and uh, got a patent and uh, started producing. This is the first Colt pistol that came out. It's uh, Patterson because the factory was in Patterson, New Jersey. I'm trying to remember if my next slide, I'll just show you to go back here once. And the uh, interesting thing about the Patterson is that it, uh, you can see there's no trigger. And the trigger is actually recessed uh, up, up into the frame of the revolver. Uh, but if you reach up with your thumb and you pull that hammer back to fire the gun, the trigger pops out the bottom. And uh, uh, why he used that particular design, uh, I, I don't know for sure, but uh, uh, very unique. But what this did for people uh, for self-protection is that now, uh, instead of having a single-shot pistol, uh, and highwaymen were... Uh, very common at the time. You could get robbed on the highways, uh, very common. And if you had a single shot pistol, you got one shot, and then he basically had a club. Well, the Colt Patterson gave you five rounds. So the first six shooter was a five shooter, if you ever see that uh, question in Trivial Pursuit. Although they were a little underpowered and a little bit delicate, and he actually went out of business because they didn't sell fast enough. Uh, he was working with Samuel Morris of the Morris Code fame, and they were working underground telegraph wire at the time uh, when the Mexican War started. And uh, one of the uh, Texas Rangers down there, Samuel Walker, was sent east to recruit troops for the war and also to try to find Samuel Colt uh, and tell him how much the Texas Rangers loved the Colt Patterson because of the, of the five shots instead of one. But it wasn't powerful or not enough. And uh, he did eventually find Colt, and they designed uh, this revolver. And Will, if you'd hold that one up just to show him the scale. Uh, the Patterson was about the size of a later model, the 1851 Navy. This one is? That is the pocket model. Pocket Dragoon? 
No, that is the uh, basically the 51 Navy's only smaller. Okay, so this is, I'm going to I'm going to show you that this is approximately the scale of the Patterson we were talking about. The, the earliest Pattersons were about that size. The Walker that Todd's showing us. So what they produced together, what they produced together was a 44 caliber, basically a handheld rifle. It held 55 grains of black powder. Which is 10 grains more than the standard 45 caliber rifle of the day. So it was a very, very powerful gun. It had six rounds instead of five. Now, one of the things that we've talked about and, and uh, uh, kind of questioned the kids on, and we have a history exam at the end of the year, uh, is what is a horse pistol? And it's funny, uh, you know, there's, there's authorities out there who can tell you the wrong thing, and I could even do that sometimes, maybe. But I was watching the History Channel, and this authority was saying a horse pistol is a pistol that was large enough and powerful enough to strike and enter all the way through the skull of an enemy's horse at 100 yards. <laughs> and I thought, if you could go through the skull of an enemy's horse at 100 yards, why don't you just shoot the enemy? But in reality, what a horse pistol is, is it's so big and heavy that you put it on your saddle. You don't, you, your horse carries it around for you, not necessarily it's in your belt. So those were seldom used as, uh, in, a, in a holster. Uh, they were in what's called a, a pommel holster, and we'll see some of those later. Uh, is, Eli, wait, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, that is why you will see the term, as you're reading yourselves and, and learning, you'll see that term, belt pistol, specifically because it's so much smaller and lighter by a pound and a half than a four pound, nine ounce empty army pistol. Yeah, and those are about five pounds a piece loaded. Um, Eli Whitney Jr. had a factory. Cole had gone out of business. He didn't have a factory anymore. And uh, so he had to go to Eli Whitney's boy and uh, they together started putting out the Colt Walker and, and it was used in the, in the uh, Mexican War. He quickly went to more uh, carryable pieces, uh, on your person carryable pieces. And, and uh, the 1851 Navy uh, was one of those models. This is a model that uh, was very prolific all the way into the Old West period. Wild Bill Hickok had two of these and uh, just loved the, the 1851 Navy pistol. It, uh, it just balanced well. It wasn't super powerful, but it was powerful enough for self-protection and uh, very, very popular on the frontier. And Todd, we can show them by, again, size comparison from Walker's 44 caliber to the 36 caliber known as the Navy pistol. Now we don't necessarily need to go into why it's a Navy pistol, but it was good marketing and good patent protection. That's how it became known as the Navy pistol instead of the Army. The, um, the inventions and things had kind of uh, uh, progressed and uh, Colt had had the, the patent on revolving cylinders all the way up until 1857. And when that patent ran out, boy, there were people just that put the machinery together, and the day the patent ran out, they were pumping out copies of Colts. Uh, and then, a little bit later, Smith & Wesson had the, had the patent on uh, loading from the rear of the chamber. And so Colt was a little bit behind on the whole idea of a, of a cartridge pistol, and he had all these, well, he was dead by now, but his company had all of these cap and ball revolvers from the Civil War left over, uh, something that was too expensive just to throw away, but the world had moved on or was beginning to move on to cartridges. And so they took the old Colt pistols uh, from the Civil War, they milled off the back of the cylinder so that you could access the, the breech of that cylinder and put a loading gate in there and just a few modifications to these cap and ball revolvers and now you could put a, use your Civil War cap and ball revolver but now put cartridges in it. And uh, conversions, they actually shoot a few of these, con re reproductions of these conversions. The last one I'll show you tonight is the 1873 Single Action Army, uh, probably the most uh, recognized cowboy gun of, of the Old West, uh, known by a lot of names, uh, the plow handle, the peacemaker, uh, hog leg. I mean, there's a lot of things that people call the Single Action Army, but definitely the uh, most popular gun of the, of the Old West. I'm going to try to make up our time here just a little bit so we uh, stay within our time frame, but if you have any questions, um, I uh, certainly ask those. It's tempting to try to teach you everything we teach the, teach the kids over the course of a year. <laughs> so uh, we try not to do that. I, I'm jumping over a lot of stuff, but just enough to give you an idea what the book's about and what the program is about. So when we go into rifles, we have a whole different individual here, uh, Oliver Fisher Winchester, and, and as Will had said, he was a shirt maker. 
He was a shrewd business person. He was not an inventor like Colt was, uh, and so he didn't invent anything, even though the Winchester rifle is one of the most famous rifles in history. And he really didn't invent that. He relied on very good employees uh, to invent that. But started getting an interest in guns as these lever action uh, rifles and pistols were coming out. He eventually bought enough uh, stock to, to have control of the company, and that's when he asked uh, one of his employees, uh, B. Tyler Henry, to invent a, a cartridge and then build a rifle around the cartridge. And what Henry came up with was the Henry rifle that Will showed you that he uses at Virginia City uh, that came out in 1860 and was very popular on the, on the frontier. The very next model after the uh, Henry rifle uh, was 1866 Winchester. And this is the first rifle that uh, Winchester actually put his name on. He was kind enough to give the actual inventor and designer of the Henry rifle uh, put his name on the Henry, but by 1866 he couldn't stand it anymore and put his own name on the, uh, on the rifle, the next rifle that came out. It operates exactly like uh, the Henry rifle, except that you can see uh, as well, it shows you how you move around the top of the barrel shroud and load from the front. This one has a loading gate, and that's called the King's Improvement because there was a guy working for, Col or for Winchester named King, and he added a four stock on the front. And a lot of people just call that rifle the improved Henry, and that's really what it was. It was a Henry rifle all over again, but with a loading gate on the side. So as we were going around the state, we, we found several 1866 Winchesters to photograph for the book, and um, we were deciding on which one to use until we were in Fort Benton and uh, asked them, do you guys have a 66 Winchester? Oh, yeah, we, could, we have one of those. Well, it turns out that this one, uh, with Chief Joseph's rifle, and it's in Fort Benton at the Interpretive Center there, and it's actually a surrender rifle. And so when, when the Nez Pierce were, were uh, defeated at the battle site near the Bear's Paw Mountains, and Chief Joseph gave his famous speech, I'll fight no more forever, and he handed a rifle over to Colonel Miles, that was, that's it, right there. And uh, that was really fun. We, got to, we actually got to hold that and prop it and and do a lot of fun photography with it, and actually get to hold something that Chief Joseph had had in his, in his hands. Uh, one of the more educational things that I learned is that since we have a, re a reproduction and we shoot that quite often, and I'm the guy that always has to clean it, I discovered that Chief Joseph has the same problem that I'd, I have of getting down in all the nooks and crannies uh, in there too, so at least I knew I wasn't alone. Uh, the blanket that's on top of it was an Ez Pierce uh, women's blanket, and she uh, traded that for food for her family. They put them on trains after the surrender and were sending them to Kansas. And uh, uh, they weren't well fed, they were just kind of herded in there and sent off. And she, tra she traded that blanket for, um, for some food. It was quite obvious to us that it had been used as a tablecloth and uh, for a long time because there's a, a, fate, a faded area in a square on that where it had been hanging off a table. And then the last uh, Winchester we'll talk about tonight is the 73, and this is a very famous Old West gun uh, as well, probably the most famous Old West rifle that there was. If you remember Jimmy Stewart, there was actually, he was in a movie called Winchester 73, and that was the movie, whole movie uh, made about that particular rifle. Uh, very similar, a little more powerful cartridge. There were some modifications and some improvements made, uh, but it operated just like the Henry in the 66. We also shoot shotguns, and so we talk about some of the more famous shotguns in the Old West. Uh, probably the best shotgun some would say ever built was the 1878 Colt. Uh, we particularly like this shotgun in our program because it has two external hammers, uh, as, and our re reproduction is pretty faithful to the original. And it's very easy for me as a range officer and Will as a range officer to look at that firearm and, and see that the hammers aren't back and that the thing is in a safe position. If the hammers are back, Obviously, uh, it is not made safe, and so that's what's nice about that particular one is uh, those exposed hammers. Not only do you see it in every John Wayne movie, but it's also an easy one to just inspect quickly. I want to talk a little bit about holsters. As we were photographing firearms and, and learning what we could about uh, each of the models, I had a head start there because that's been an, an interest for, for a long, long time, but the question of what makes what makes an authentic Old West holster uh, was something I hadn't really thought that much about, and so we did quite a bit of investigation 
and tried to come up with a chapter that really showed how these holsters developed uh, from the early days all the way up until the Old West, and also how rifles were carried around. Interestingly, you see the, uh, the saddle scabbard in, in all the westerns, and even when I was watching the Hatfields and McCoys uh, on the history, was that the History Channel? Whoever put that out. Uh, one of the men was deserting and heading home from the Civil War, uh, and he hops on his horse and he puts his rifle in a scabbard and off he goes. And uh, in reality, the scabbard wasn't invented yet, and so he wouldn't have done that. It seems very logical that somebody would have thought of that, but the most common way to carry your rifle is just to carry it. Uh, or to have a sling on it, uh, like the one on the bottom. This is a reproduction on the this bottom right-hand corner picture, uh, but that has a belt hook, which is quite unique for a rifle because normally you found those on pistols and it kept the pistol, if you put it in your waistband, it kept it from going right down the leg of your pants. Uh, but with the rifle, I uh, didn't see that all that often, but could very easily hang in saddle rigging or, or be strapped or something to the, to the saddle. Another way to carry would just be right around your saddle horn, just like that. A lot of times the guys would have a, a leather bag that went over the top of the action, because if you got your, your flint and your frizzing wet and, and, and any moisture down in the pan, the gun wouldn't go off. But majority of the guns are very much exposed to the weather. Military carried them on a sling and uh, had a hook at the bottom of the sling. And on the other end of the firearm, they inserted it down into the... Uh, carbine socket or carbine uh, boot and so you would have a your strap around here your gun just hanging off this hook the hook was attached to a, a little steel bar or a ring on the side of the on the side of the rifle the other end was put into the uh, end of the boot and uh, you would gallop along this is Mexican War era you would gallop along with this rifle just flopping back and forth but that's that's the way the military uh, happened to uh, carry them uh, the disastrous thing, most disa besides being shot, the most disastrous thing that could happen to you if you fall off your horse and your, end of your barrel gets caught in that thing, uh, it would just drag you until it finally, the barrel finally popped out of that little leather pouch on the, below it, which is then attached to the saddle with this leather strap right here. We'll clear up into the late Indian Wars before the military started putting rifles in a scabbard and uh, uh, this one, again, not a whole lot of protection for the firearm. You can see the barrel just hanging out the bottom. And uh, you've protected the action, and you don't have it flopping around on your shoulder, but still not exactly a very uh, easy way or a very good way of carrying a gun around as far as the weather goes. The actual saddle scabbard, the civilians started using the cowboy-style saddle scabbard in the 1870s, and the uh, military didn't use it until the 1890s uh, for whatever reason. So we move into... And the pistols, uh, pistols really weren't carried that much um, as commonly as you would think until they became pretty handy to carry around in a holster and things. And uh, one way to carry it, this is a boot gun. It's a percussion cap would go on there and you'd load it as a muzzle loader and it will go down inside of your boot and you can see it's not very ornate. It's made for uh, across a table as one shot and, and hope for the best. A lot of knives were also carried in boots. Another unique found, find that we found in Fort Benton uh, were these pommel holsters. And uh, rather than carrying guns on your, on your person, the flintlock pistols, the caplock pistols, uh, most of the time before the, 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 hold, the belt gun, uh, folks would put their pistols in these pommel holsters. There'd be one on either side of the saddle. Now, they did very much cover the, the uh, pistol. And so you did have a lot of protection from the weather. You can see here it is with, the, with it open. It would actually go up on the saddle rig in this. Um, we didn't take this all apart at the museum. We just set it in front. Uh, but it would hold two pistols for you. The disadvantage of not having the pistol on your person is now if you fell off your horse, you lost your guns. And uh, not a real advantage either. But they were protected from the weather. Pony Express is probably one of the more common places where you'd see uh, pommel holster guns with the pommel bags. And... Uh, this one actually is a civilian. These are all original museum pieces. But another, another common way of carrying that uh, gun on your horse instead of on your person would be protected under the flap of a small saddle bag that went on the front uh, of your saddle. Some of the neat things we were able to find as we're finding authentic things from the Old West period, uh, 
not only the, the gun itself was original to the period, and of course the pommel bags, but then the, the little gold scale uh, that was used in Helena and one of the uh, certificates from uh, one of the financial institutions in Helena during the gold rush days. Typical Eastern belt holster would have a flap over it, made a lot of sense. Uh, you not only kept your pistol secure in there, but it also protected it uh, from the weather. As we went out west, people like to get at their gun a little faster, and you'd see a lot of these eastern holsters. These are at the Museum of the Rockies. Uh, that's the old flap that's just been cut off, and uh, there's actually the finial where you would have flapped, flipped it over the top. And they just converted that flap holster to just an open holster so they could get at their gun faster. And the only reason that came about it's primarily because of the gold rush, uh, and miners that were lucky enough to find gold also got robbed uh, quite a bit. One of the ways you know that this particular one came from the earliest of that era is that you'll notice it's a right-hand holster, just like this one, but it's butt forward. That's how you know it's an early one and it's a legitimate cut down, because the military style wasn't but the rear was butt forward. That was for military purposes. So this type of a holster with the flap cut off became the first rapid draw, quick, easy carry holster. But then they started losing their handguns. That's why they find so many relics in so many fields. Yeah, and that's, that's, uh, it, 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 it's just interesting how things progressed. And, and uh, yeah, there was nothing to secure your pistol. You see the little leather thong that, that's over the top of the hammer and a lot of holsters, uh, even Old West holsters in the movies and stuff, they'll hook them down. You, you, you look at the original holsters, they didn't have that. And uh, most of them were snug enough, you didn't lose your pistol, but boy, there's an awful lot of farmers that have found pistols out when they started plowing. And it's just interesting that there wasn't something better to secure, to secure that handgun. Uh, this is pretty typical of the California pattern. This is the very first holster uh, that was specifically made in the Old West period that can be called a Western holster, designed in the 1850s in California. And uh, this one, this particular model, was from Maine and Winchester, not, a, not anywhere related to the firearm Winchester, but a leather goods company, Maine and Winchester in San Francisco. And they started making holsters in the West for the gold miners. And uh, what makes it unique, very tight, snug, built very close to the, to the pistol that's going to go in it. Also, they call this a recurve. It's a double recurve because the leather behind the trigger guard is missing too. So they cut it out on both sides so you can get your finger into the trigger. They also cut a, a recurve up on top so they can get your thumb on the hammer and it's kind of a, a very fast way to, uh, to get your gun into position to protect yourself. I asked the, uh, this is from a private collection, I asked the gentleman how much that really was worth and he said that's a $10,000 piece of leather right there because it's from the 1850s from a very a uh, very famous leather goods company in San Francisco. A uh, very similar style. This one's out of uh, St. Louis, Missouri. And uh, you'll notice that this is during this California period holster, or California pattern holster, came out in the period before cartridges. And so you keep all of your uh, bullets and ammunition and things in here, uh, sometimes caps and loose bullets. Uh, and then you'd have a, a, a loading can for your powder. And there's no, of course, no uh, cartridge loose because cartridges weren't popular yet. They hadn't, some of them hadn't been invented and they hadn't gone widespread. And so you could have a relatively narrow belt loop on the back of that, on the back of that holster and uh, that narrow belt that then would go through it. As cartridges got to be more and more popular and people wanted to carry ammunition with them, uh, the belts got wider is to accommodate the belt, the uh, cartridge loops and the cartridges that went in them. And at about the same time, uh, that wide belt also was popular because they liked to carry money and documents and coins and things like that inside these belts. And so uh, uh, they're secured when you put the, the tongue together to the other side of the belt and you buckle it, nothing can fall out. But the interior is all hollow. It's a folded over piece of leather and sewn along the bottom so that uh, you could put those documents and things in your belt. What that created was a wide belt, and the California pattern holster uh, could not accommodate that, that wide belt. So the next one that came out during the cartridge era, era was this, they called it the Mexican loop holster, and it originated more than likely in Mexico, the legend would have it, or at least in the, in the Southwest. 
and it has a, a back skirt of leather and in that back skirt they cut out a couple of slits and then the whole pattern can be made out of one flat piece of leather you just fold it over and sew it together and then fold it over your your belt and stick it through the slits in the back skirt and that created a very very wide belt loop uh, that was necessary for these new uh, guns and um, belts coming out. There's a similar type idea. This is a, a Mexican loop holster, or a loop holster, you could just call it, it's from Fort Benton. And uh, it was made by Joseph Sullivan, who was a leather goods uh, gentleman there for many, many years during the Old West period. Uh, we not only got to find the real Joe Sullivan holster and belt, but uh, also his business card and his shaving mug. So it was kind of fun pulling all these artifacts together and being able to pose these pictures uh, that, get, that tell a little bit more of the story than uh, just a, a gun on a white background. This is the Moran Brothers out of Miles City. So you can see that uh, uh, the you know, leather goods men were everywhere and we've kind of hit the most famous ones. Now this would be called a toe plug and you could either have your holster with a toe plug or open toed, they call it. And uh, it, this was the preference of the particular person buying the holster. Some guys like to have a toe plug because if you happen to be working in the north and, and you got off your horse and you're doing something with the cow and you got too close to the snow, it would plug up the end of your gun. Uh, other guys said, well, we just soon have it open because when you got a toe plug in it, you get leaves and dirt and all kinds of stuff when you're riding through the brush or uh, and it just accumulates at the bottom of your holster. So it was just up to, uh, up to each individual on which one they might prefer. So the, 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 the guns, although there were many of them, were relatively easy to identify. They're, they're well documented. They're antique pieces. Um, there's collectors. There's books. There's all kinds of stuff uh, to help us with these guns, model numbers, serial numbers, and all of that. When we got into the hats, boots, and chaps, and clothing, it became a little more difficult because what's available in the 1860s through 1900, uh, there, there isn't any tags, there's no model numbers, there's no serial numbers, there really wasn't anything to, to really help us date these things. But we got lucky because we were in Nebraska uh, at the National 4-H Shooting Sports Championships. They had a bunch of kids down there competing for a national championship. And not too far away was the Bertrand Museum which we discovered had the steamboat that had left St. Louis in March of 1865 and was chugging up the Missouri River and it was planning uh, to dock at Fort Benton and absolutely full of goods uh, that would be offloaded in Fort Benton and then uh, brought to Bozeman, Virginia City, Helena, Deer Lodge were the bigger areas at the time, uh, some to, to Bannock as well. And unfortunately when it was uh, going past Nebraska Council of Bluffs area. Uh, it had a snag, they call it, a tree under the water, and it rammed it right through the hull and down she went. It got covered over with mud relatively rapidly and they didn't get all the goods off of it. And over a hundred years the river actually, Missouri River actually changed its course. And so uh, in 1968, I guess they were treasure hunters, uh, had read enough documents, knew the Bertrand was out there somewhere. And it was under a cornfield in uh, Iowa and they dug it up and found the whole thing was just full of goods from 1865. It sank in April 1st, and so basically what this provided us with is a time capsule of what was going to be delivered to Montana in 1865. Hats, boots, different kinds of shoes, different kinds of pants, uh, dresses, all kinds of things. So very popular hat style, 1860s, is this flat top uh, hat with a hat band around it. Uh, the cheaper ones were made of wool, and the more expensive ones would have made, been made of beaver. Uh, beaver will repel water quite well. Uh, the wool ones, after a period of time in the rain, or, or several times in the rain, they start to fall down like a, like a bonnet. If you ever see uh, in any of the Old West books of the cowboys riding, and they had the front of their cowboy hat uh, up in front like this, and some of them even pinned it to the front of their hat, uh, and a lot of that was because they had a cheap wool hat and it got wet so many times it had no stiffness to it and when they galloped along it slapped them in the nose and they just pulled that brim up and put it up under the, under the crown. The boss of the Plains was the first Stetson that came out, uh, at least the first John B. Stetson hat that came out. Uh, he had been west, recognized the need for, uh, for a good hat in the west. He knew how to make hats. His family had been part of that business for 
many, many years. And so uh, he happened to hit it just right when the uh, cattle drives were going to Kansas and the actual cowboys were becoming a profession uh, and getting to be known as cowboys. He hit the market with the boss of the plains. Well, everybody, every cowboy wanted one. They were very uh, narrow brimmed up here in the north because of the windy plains. They were wider brimmed in the south because there wasn't so much wind and there's more sun. Just depending on uh, what location uh, you happen to be in is what, what you may order. And uh, mostly a domed top is the way they came from the factory. And then a lot of them had the uh, ribbon like this would have been the factory uh, delivery, just a ribbon around it. This one is Charlie Russell's and uh, it's at the uh, museum in Great Falls and he's, he's put a horsehair hat band on his. So we thought, all right, so now we've got the boss of the plains, but you see everybody's hat is creased, in all the cowboy shows anyway. We thought, well, what's an authentic crease uh, from the period, and what would, how would you crease your hat and, and really look uh, authentic to the 1860s through 1900? Well, I ran across this photograph, and uh, the unique thing about it is that it was taken from the second floor of a, of a church, and it's all of Grant's officers, and they're planning the Battle of Cold Harbor. Well, we get to see the top of their head, and you normally don't see that uh, in photographs. Anybody that uh, wore a hat a lot of times for the picture, they would tilt it back so you could see their face. Uh, so this was kind of neat. And as we looked at it, we are like, boy, about every kind of, there's a crease in the middle. Uh, there's kind of a, sort of a telescoping top, they call it. Here's another one. And uh, some were pin a little more pinched in the front. Pretty much about any uh, type of crease you can think of is represented somewhere on one of these men. Uh, one thing we discovered is when the boss of the planes would arrive right, with the dome top, some guys left it like that. Others would form a crease just basically on how they took it on and off their head. And uh, we did find some regional differences, but this gave us some good historical accountability uh, on what uh, hats may look like uh, and what creases may look like clear back in the Civil War era. Pretty good guide. There's this guy, again, they call it the telescoping, telescoping crease. Uh, this one is pretty much creaseless, just dented in. Uh, but a lot, of different, a lot of different styles, so you knew that they weren't all Army issue. Uh, they were very much to the preference of the wearer. Of course, not everybody wore cowboy hats, so we have the, uh, the top hat. And uh, light colors were acceptable during the day, uh, black in, in the evening. And we also have the bowler, if you were English. Uh, also known as the Derby, if you were American, uh, is another very popular hat of the Old West period. This is called the Opera Hat. I'd read about them, never thought I'd find one, but they had two of them in Virginia City. The Opera Hat uh, was a top hat, but it was made of uh, silk, sometimes uh, real other light material, and it had a little coiled spring in there. And uh, when you went to the theater, you, would, uh, you could take it off, you could compress that spring, it had a little hook inside, and you could hook it so it stayed shut. And then you had this compressed-looking thing, and you set it between you and the person next to you between your seats, and you weren't fumbling around with this top hat on your lap through the whole theater. And then, of course, when the show was over, you just flip the little hook in there, and it pops back out to a top hat, and, and away you go. So it was nice that we were able to have one that was compressed and one that was uh, extended just, to, just for comparison. Women's hats. Uh, they had what they called the caps, which were relatively small, uh, little, almost like a bonnet. Uh, some of them just covered the bun and, and of, their, of their hair and up over the top of their head a little bit. Anybody recognize what those things might be? Hat pins, and I'll show you where those were so important. That's where the hat pin really came in handy. By the time we got to the 1880s, uh, women were adorning their hats with feathers. And it started out with feathers, and then it went to whole wings, and then by the late 1880s, it had gone to whole birds. And so uh, they had this huge, colorful thing on their head, and hat pins got to be uh, uh, very, very important. You could just drive that through the side of your hat and through your bun in your hair and out the other side and not have your hat blow away every time you went outdoors. These types of styles were actually the beginning of uh, some of the first animal rights movements. 
and uh, folks would go to South America and bring back as many as 20,000 uh, different species of birds because they were so colorful, colorful in, in South America. And uh, quite an uproar in London when people found out how many birds were being slaughtered and, and got quite upset with it. Some of the shoes off the Bertrand steamboat. Uh, cowboy boots obviously weren't the only thing out there, and, but we do see a very strong pattern with the square toe. That uh, was common in shoes and boots both. And you know, you talk about fashion and all the new things that come around and, and everybody's all hot for these new things. Well, if you go to Murdoch's and look at the boots, they're all square toed and people think that's the newest, greatest thing ever. <laughs> well, these are from 1865, right off the Bertrand. You know, I wore square toed boots most of my life, Todd. We called them ropers. Yeah. <laughs> This is just another example of it, stacked leather heel. Very, very good stuff. Uh, surprisingly high quality and, and really, really well made. They had a slick bottom on quite a few of them, the town shoe they might call this. And I always wondered how in the world would you ever stand up uh, in the mud or in the snow or uh, even wet grass going up a little bank. You'd be sliding all over the place. And that's how they did it. That's the fraction of the 1860s. It's their hobnails. These are very ornate in their pattern. A lot of them would just be, you know, the lines across the, the sole of the boot, but uh, that's what, what uh, was served as your traction, so they weren't nearly as slick as you might think. And then the heel protector protected that stacked uh, leather heel, and it's not something you'd want to wear home on the, on the hardwood floors. Chap patterns started out early in, in uh, Texas. There's a whole history to these. Uh, but the most common one of our period from 1860 to 1900 was the shotgun shaft. And they were put on like pants. They didn't zip up the back. They weren't zippers yet. Uh, they were sewed in a, in a seam, and you put them on just like you would a pair of pants, uh, protected your legs from the brush. Up north, they put on their hair pants, they call them, or woolies. And they were shotgun shafts with the hair left on, but it sure was nice in the wintertime to have that extra protection. Most guys in the north, other than the woolies in the winter, didn't wear chaps. They weren't through the brush and the cactus like the guys in Texas were. And then the batwing. And uh, batwing shafts are very late in the period. They're more of a late eight, mid to late 1890s style of shaft. They were more uh, ornate. They had this big flap of leather. You could, you could unclip them on the back and you'd kind of step into them and, and clip them around behind you and put them on. Uh, but they're more of a rodeo shop for the uh, Wild West shows that started up in the late 1890s. So I want to just talk a little bit about men's and women's clothing, and then we'll answer any questions and, and, uh, and go from there. This is a pair of men's underwear, drawers, they call them, a button fly in the front. Uh, by the 1880s, you'd see elastic around the cuffs instead of drawstrings. And uh, this particular pair has a drawstring still around, around the waist. But if you ever got so scared that you filled your drawers, well, that's what you were filling right there. Uh, pants, by and large, uh, were, a lot of them were wool in the north. Uh, the guys in Texas did like the canvas pants. But you can see there's, there's no belt loops. They were made for suspenders. On the back, they had this strap right here that they actually did call the belt. And uh, that... Just kind of tight, tighten them up right above your buns, basically, and that's what, that's what held your pants up unless you wore, unless you wore suspenders. It's interesting that uh, you, know, you, you read a lot of different books and, and get a lot of different opinions, and we were told that cowboys hated suspenders because they cut into your shoulders, and no cowboy would wear suspenders. They just hated the things. And then you see a picture, and half the guys are wearing suspenders. And so whenever you deal in absolutes, um, you find out you're probably wrong. That uh, high rise in the back, they're higher in the front than today's kind of low-cut uh, pair of pants. Um, Levi's didn't put belt loops on their pants until 1922. And so this is very popular. This is the style of men's pant all the way into, uh, into the 1920s. Men's pants were pretty, or men's clothing altogether, were, were uh, relatively easy to, to study. There's a, a pair of wool pants. This came off the Bertrand as well. You can see a very ni nice, tight-knit wool. Uh, this is from the Range Riders Museum in, in Miles City. And it's unique because you see a guy from the back. Uh, just by the way those pants kind of fall, you can tell that they're wool. He's got that, that belt strap in the back. 
He's also wearing a garter up on his sleeve. And, uh, you know, when you see, if you remember the old westerns, that was always the bartender that had the, gar uh, the garter. But when you bought a store-bought shirt, they didn't have all the different sizes that they have today. Uh, so you bought one, it would make more sense to buy one a little bit too big than too small. And when you did that, a lot of times the sleeve went right over your hand, and, and uh, that garter would actually hold that sleeve off of your wrist. By and large, shirts, this is uh, wool. Uh, this particular reproduction shirt is, is cotton. You see that one has uh, no collar on it. This one right here has only just the banded collar like, like that does. They do button about to the top of the stomach, and they were all a pullover. And so the button-up blouse did not uh, come into fashion until around 1900 for men. And the United States Army didn't go to the full button-down blouse until 1941. So you still had pullover shirts much like that. If you were buying a decent shirt that you wanted to keep clean for a long, long time, you would have uh, no collar on it. And if you were doing, going to town and going to church or something where you actually wanted to look a little more fancy, you could put a collar on. This one, the reproduction one's made out of cotton. Uh, there's a button back here. You'd button it to the back of, your, back of your shirt collar, bring it around in the front and there's two buttonholes there and you'd put this steel stud through the buttonholes and through the front of your collar and you'd hold that in place and then could put a tie on or whatever you wanted to do to do from there. Now ladies I think it's important to mention that this is the purpose of starch. Starch is what you need to know. It's your friend. The more starch you use the fewer times this has to be boiled and cleaned. Unless of course your man is well enough off that he can buy paper collars and dispose of them every day or two depending on how quickly they foul. But starch will keep clothing clean longer. It'll also keep your dresses stiffer and cleaner, especially in your petticoats. If they're Here's not some stiff of the... enough to stand in a corner, they're not starched enough. <laughs> These are some of the uh, disposable collars that Will was talking about, a lot of different styles. Uh, they're cardboard, heavy stock paper, or cardboard, or celluloid, some of them were. And if they soiled too much on one side, uh, you would just roll them around the other way and wear the other side, and when they were soiled on both sides, you just threw them out. Those uh, were the paper ones. Yeah, these particular ones have a label uh, stamped on the inside, and of course you couldn't wear it the other way around. This picture is a blacksmith shop down in uh, Bozeman in the 1870s. And uh, as we were looking at clothing, I, I just started to, as I was looking at this picture, I thought, boy, this is just a ideal example of collars versus no collars, good shirts worth, worth uh, versus uh, work shirts. These two guys are working in the blacksmith shop. You can see he's got a collared shirt and he has a collared shirt. Perfectly acceptable. It's a work shirt. If he gets ring around the collar, who cares? It's a work shirt. This gentleman is visiting and he is properly dressed for being out in society. Even though he's not going to a formal meeting, he's still dressed for public, much better than we do now. So he has his collar off. If he was going to church, he'd have a collar on and probably some sort of a tie. But he's also got a vest and a coat. For these two gentlemen to be out around town, like the guy on the left, and not be wearing a vest and coat would have been absolutely hideous. Uh, it was, these, your shirt was considered really almost a part of your underwear, and you did not go out in your shirt sleeves. Uh, you went out with the, with the coat on, and uh, you did not appear like the working men did. When you're working, that's fine, but if you're going out into flight company, it absolutely was not. Showed the slideshow in Bozeman, guy came up to me afterwards and said, hey, that's my great grandpa. <laughs> and that's really cool. Pretty neat, pretty neat stuff. On coats, now one way to date a very old coat, you can see that seam that, that today goes right down the top of the shoulder. Now it goes, to, in the old days, goes right to the back, uh, behind the back of your uh, shoulder instead of right along the top. Uh, that would have will move to the top into the 1900s. Just a different way of the way they put these things together. Another, just another example of it. This came off the Bertrand, so this is another 1865 art, artifact. Town coats and frock coats were very popular uh, as well. And so these are out of Virginia City. Just really, really well-made stuff. I started to tell you it was easy uh, with men's fashions. Things changed a little bit, there, there's no doubt. But, Men are, were the same way they are now. You find something you like and you just stick with it. And so from 1860 to 1900, pretty much nothing changed. Women, on the other hand, 
about every two years there was a change of, of fashion, and so we could never even hope to keep up with that. Uh, but the curator in Virginia City tried on the women's drawers for us, and of course we couldn't photograph them the way they were supposed to be worn, or it would be improper, uh, but they were very handy for the outhouse. Another set of drawers, the union suit, which was a union of the top and the bottom. It just made one layer of underwear for you, so you had one less bulge around your waist to try to tuck in. Uh, you can see that um, trap door in the back, this would be more of a winter style. This could be a little more of a spring style with no sleeves, but another pair of drawers for women. So we're going to go through the process of getting dressed if you were a woman and actually getting dressed to go out on the town. So you'd put on your, your drawers, uh, then you'd put on uh, a petticoat under, underneath, and then you'd put on your crinoline, they call it, or hoops for a hoop skirt. Then you put petticoats over the top of your hoops, and a minimum of two. Uh, you could go six or eight or however big you wanted the thing to hoop out. Then you'd put on what they called the under corset. It was like a, like a t-shirt. Sometimes you could just use your, your uh, drawers and, and shirt. Put the corset on. Somewhere in the process, they put on their socks, and I, I would guess it was before they put on their hoops, but we know we're not 100% sure. You'd put your corset on, then you'd have an over corset to hide your corset, and then you'd put on your dress. This is a ball gown. I believe it's here in this museum now, isn't it? Yeah. It was originally in Virginia City, and um, something like 33 yards of fabric it would take to put together one of these ball gowns. So you can imagine the expense people went to uh, to put these together. But absolutely immaculate, just a beautiful, beautiful uh, construction and, and worksmanship, craftsmanship. Uh, of course, the other way for women to dress would be the, the bodice and the, and the separate skirt, as well as, as the full length dress. And then in the wintertime, if it wasn't enough, you'd put on your overcoat, and that'd keep you warm in the sleigh or in the carriage. This one's off the Bertrand. So when you got home, finally, you'd take all that stuff off, you'd put on your your house coat, dressing gown, they called them. And this is an original from the, this one's from the 1890s. So they actually did have bathrobes. Uh, here's one from uh, also about the same period. Actually, that last one was 1860s, this one's 1890s. So we move from the 1870s now, and we get into the 1880s, and the, uh, the hoop skirt kind of went away, uh, fell out of favor and fashion, and now we're to the bustle period, and you can see uh, instead of having the hoop all the way around, we've just made, created this ledge in down the back. And the dresses then were, if you owned a dress uh, during the hoop period, you didn't want to throw it away and buy a new one. That was just way too expensive. So they are altered now for all the fabric to be pulled uh, to the rear and hang off the bustle. A little difficult to sit down. And I think it's Slewfoot Sue, who was dating Pecos Bill in the old fairy, not fairy tale, whatever you'd call it, children's book. And when Widowmaker bucked her off, she went right over the moon because it bounced her off on the, uh, her bustle. <laughs> so here is our Hollywood cowboys from the 1950s, early 1960s. And uh, we show this to the, to the kids just as a comparison. Every one of these guys has button-down blouse. Wasn't, in, wasn't invented until after 1900. Uh, they also have a holster, they're called the Buscadero rig, which wasn't invented until after 1900. They have tie-downs, which very, very, very few men ever did. Um, they've got belts on, along with their gun belts, they've got regular belts, so there weren't belt loops on their pants until 1922. <laughs> so you can see there's a lot uh, uh, to be desired in the authentic authenticity of the, of the characters on television. The nice thing about the characters on television is they kind of developed our character a little bit, and, and uh, even though they weren't historically accurate, uh, they were good guys. And unfortunately on TV, we don't have that many good guys anymore. Uh, to end this thing for you, these are just some artifacts uh, off of the Bertrand. Quite literally, you could get anything in 1865 in Montana that you could get in New York City. Uh, if you had the money, it would get put on a boat and it would get here. So you can see all of the... Uh, different bottles, uh, apricots, uh, cherries, look like olives, but they've been in that bottle for 120 some years and 100 and, geez, 40 some years now. Yeah. Uh, cherries to the left. There's a little more close up to it. Uh, in alcohol, be interesting to see what that smelled like. 
and uh, canned goods. Canned goods got to be really, really big in the Civil War. We had to move food around, had to get these guys fed, and had to be able to be preserved. So the top of the can would be off. You drop the contents in. The top of the can would be soldered shut, except for a little hole. You can see this drop of solder on each one. And when you would can them, the pressure would go out that little hole, and when it met the right temperature, boop, you dropped a little drop of solder on it, and you had canned peaches or whatever you were canning. Axe heads. All crated up and ready to go uh, to the west. Candles. Beautiful, beautiful uh, porcelain. And uh, china, and boy, there's all kinds of stuff on that boat. It's absolutely gorgeous. And so much of it uh, survived so well. It was out of light and out of the air. And as long as it was underwater and not uh, with any light on it, it was preserved quite well. All the cutlery. Now there's, of course, liquid ink. There also was dried ink that you'd mix with water when it got to the destination. Lanterns. They got all the guns off. Uh, the, the, as far as uh, anybody knows, they apparently got those off before the thing covered over with mud. Did not get to the uh, powder flasks or to the percussion caps and the lead that would be used to make bullets when it, when it came out west. These were all owned by private companies. The divers were after the government... Uh, payroll, the artillery pieces, and the mercury that was coming to the minefields uh, in uh, flasks. So that's what the salvage divers were after. And this is something that a lot of people don't think about with what actually survives, the things that weren't worth anything. Weren't worth as much to the people. On the, yeah. And there also was insurance. And I'd like to study insurance a little bit just to see exactly when all that started. But uh, a lot, all of these boat captains had insurance, and so if they lost everything, it was it was better just collecting the insurance than trying to. They paid they paid for one of those steamboats in a single trip. That's yeah, the profit was, was crazy. They rarely survived more than twelve. It's like that porcelain. The market was there that much money in Montana at the time. That actually, Todd, if I may, uh, what we, what Todd referred to as porcelain is actually ironstone. Oh, okay. It was a lower end. Uh, China, very beautiful. It's all in very good shape today, but it's not imported porcelain. Okay. But, but even still, the, the yes, porcelain from the from the Orient could be had. Yeah. Well, the money was with the guys, of course, that were making the money. You know, the, the, the merchants and folks in Virginia City who were living off the miners, who weren't a lot of them didn't make much. A few of them made a ton. Okay. Uh, your your chances of your odds of making money were much better if you owned a store or a barber shop or a saloon or something like that. Mining the miners was. The thing to do. That was a profitable business. And uh, it helps leach the gold out of the rock, out of the ore. And Will actually could do it for you. <laughs> so if you'd like to explain it a little bit. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. You, uh, you take your, when you're doing hard rock mining or you're working with chlorides, sulfides, uh, you roast the ore uh, with and alter it to a metallic state from a, from a, from a chloride or a sulfide. And then uh, whether you have it in a raw metal state or whether you have it in an altered chemical state, uh, the Washoe process was to have uh, baths of mercury that you floated and pushed the crushed rock across, which then absorbed, actually leached the precious metals out of the rock. So that what they were doing in the 1860s was plaster mining. They were finding raw mineral, raw gold, raw silver, but raw gold primarily in all the gulch, uh, in, the, in the dirt. So nuggets, flakes. Uh, as, they, as they developed the mining, they went into hard rock mining. Hard rock mining, you brought all the ore out of the ground, you put it through a mill, you then processed that crushed ore, and then retorted or boiled off the mercury, leaving behind the precious metals that it had uh, leached out of the rock. No, actually, uh, because they knew that this was a problem. The, the people that were at the most risk of difficulty were the men who they finally said, you can't wear cuffs and you can't have pockets in your clothing when you leave the mill, because they were high grading by letting mercury splash into their boots or into the cuffs of their clothing and taking it home and retorting it themselves. Now, the miners who lived in a small cabin, and you may have heard of this, Take your mercury that you've been putting your crushed rock in, put it in a potato, and cook the potato. 
Well, that's putting the mercury vapor into the air in the cabin. Those men went mad, often. Became very ill or worse. But the regular miners, they knew the hazards, they knew that there was a problem, and when they were retorting, they were actually capturing, vaporizing the mineral, recapturing it for reuse in the system, distilling it back into mercury. So you didn't, it wasn't a one-off process. There's always some loss. Because they didn't have a retort. They didn't have, oh, that, was that was a way of holding it and then, and when they were done, there'd be a little ingot of metal which they would then take to the assayer who would then assay it for whatever gold, silver, or other impurities and then pay them based on weight, based on the assay. This one really was a fun find. This is the box of matches uh, and it was going to Vivian and Simpson. Uh, at Virginia City, Montana Territory. So it came off the Bertrand and, and uh, uh, actually has signage telling us where that one was going. They had 14 boxes, 14 crates of these matches, and um, the chemical all kind of melted or mixed together when, they, uh, when it was underwater. And sulfur. As it when started to dry out? Poof, they went up. And they almost lost everything on the Bertrand, and it, they, they had in a warehouse after they dug it up. Uh, because of these things combusting, and they only they saved just this one crate of matches, and they had uh, intern students then who sat there and took all the chemical that was left off the matches. All five thousand and thirty something matches in the crate have been hand scraped. Well, and they, <laughs> yeah, this is our government at work. They were counting matches, and they not only wanted to just know if it had been me, I'd like to know how many pounds of nails were on the Bertrand. But if you're the federal government, you'd like to know exactly how many nails are on the Bertrand. And so they had people counting the dumb things. And there are millions of nails. On They're the actually Bertrand. emptying the cakes that they've recovered and counting one. Two, oh, my gosh. <laughs> uh, I want to just talk about what the kids have got out of this. My knowledge of Old West history and firearms has increased. 67% uh, of the kids said agreed or strongly agreed. I'll continue to study the Old West on my own. 78%. I better appreciate the lifestyles and challenges of the American frontier, 70%. This project has made me more interested in history in general, 70%. So it's pretty neat stuff. Uh, I'd be able to use what I learned in school. About 60% of the kids could use it in school. The life skills I've learned in this project will help me in other areas of my life, 100% said that. I've gained self-confidence, 67%. I'm more aware of the safety precautions anytime I'm around firearms, about 78%. That, that, that's one of those research questions you think, God, I wish it was 100%. But 22% might have already been safe around firearms, and so they didn't feel like that went up. Any. That was actually some discussion around that was what they had said. Uh, well, you didn't teach me anything new. I already knew what, what I've, I, in terms of safety and handling. So uh, the kids I've spoken to, that's certainly a valid point. Yeah, yeah, and it's just the, the way you write questions, you don't think about it till afterwards. Uh, some of the sources used to study uh, history, of course, the Internet, uh, books, magazines, television, conversations with relatives, that was a big one for us. We, we really wanted to see that. Uh, talk, have a reason to talk to Grandma and Grandpa. Visiting historic sites. Uh, and museum visits, and we were disappointed that museum visits were at the bottom of at least the bottom of the top seven. Uh, but then when you think it's frequency of use, and so you don't go to the museum as often as you visit the Internet. And it's, it's so much easier to visit the Internet, read a book, a magazine, or watch TV. Uh, so it's just important that the museum visits were up there on the list, uh, regardless if they are number one or not. And this has been an interesting one, the Internet one. Part of what the local leaders are doing, because we're talking from the idea of creating the program, of trying to attract the interest, of trying to start the process. But what these kids are doing is they're going off the internet and they're challenging what they're reading. They're saying, wait a minute, that's not what I heard or read over here. And they're starting to catch on that just because it's on the internet doesn't make it so. And when I hear, when I hear the youth, when I hear kids saying, well, well you, you do this, what, why is this instead of this? I read this over here. I love it because then I know we're, we're getting that process going and we're, we're going far beyond just pulling the trigger and having. Well, and we're learning every day. We don't, we're not experts. It just, uh, we know more than the average kid, most of the time. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> when you go to the state shoot, uh, you not only have to shoot well, but you have to know your history, and you also get a clothing evaluation. 
Uh, these are scores. These are very similar, similar uh, tests as far as difficulty uh, in 2009 versus 2010. A lot of the same kids. So you can see what scores had done just in that one year period at the state, at the state championship. Uh, elevated considerably. I can't compare 2011 and 2012 because I made the test a lot harder because it wasn't much of a challenge any longer. <laughs> And then their clothing is evaluated. They don't have to own all the clothing, but they need to, if they're asked a question about pants or shirts or whatever, they need to be able to answer that question. They don't actually have to own reproductions or authentic stuff. Blue jeans and boots are fine, but you need to know your stuff if you don't own it. My favorite part of the project is a combination of shooting sports and history. Being able to use the information in school. A lot of crossover. I mean, we could think of a ton more things uh, than, than uh, what's up here. Uh, but of course, all of the things that, uh, that would be natural, leather craft, the foods, woodworking, clothing, uh, your sewing and all that kind of thing. But then we get into uh, video and photography and stuff the kids are doing uh, for the project that they put in their books and are able to use and display at fair. Uh, set activities are science, engineering, and, and technology, and that's, you know, there's ballistics, there's how much your gun kicks, how much your bullet drops, all kinds of things to, uh, to learn in science. So that's, uh, that's all we're going to tell you uh, on the slideshow. I sure appreciate your patience. I'm sorry we had to reboot this whole thing. I don't know how it got, how it got stuck, but uh, we've kept you much longer than, than normal, although Will was very entertaining. So, yeah. <laughs>